Hi everybody. In this video, we're going to learn about the very popular SVG image format. You know, SVGs have been around for quite some time, but they've been getting a lot of popularity recently, and we'll learn more about what they are, what makes them really cool, and some tips and tricks on when you should use them and when you should maybe consider using another image format. And maybe we'll cover some other stuff as well. Who knows? Let's find out. When it comes to displaying images on the web, there have been three formats that we've been using for a very long time that are almost the standards. The first one is the PNG format, which is no compression, lossless, a lot of colors, great for displaying photos, diagrams, icons, and text-based things that aren't too crazy because the file size is a problem for PNGs. Whereas JPEG is also great for photos and things with a lot of colors, but it does introduce compression. So if you want really crisp or really precise lines or really sharp edges, JPEG may not be the best format, but it's a good compromise if you want a lot of pig visuals, but not too much in terms of file size. So it's a, you know, it's in the middle of these three things. And the last one is GIF, which has been around for probably as long as the dinosaurs have been around. It displays only up to 256 colors, so it's limited in its color palette, but it does, uh, but it does offer no compression, and you can also have animated GIFs as well, dancing banana and things like that that you might have seen back in the day. But SVG is something that is not new. It's an image format that's been around since 1999, and SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. And it's one of those rare moments where each letter, this acronym, each word in the acronym, actually has a very important meaning. So why SVG? What is it about SVGs that makes them really interesting that we should consider using them? And the biggest thing is, it's a vector image format. And what that really means is this. A vector image format will fully retain its crispness and all the details, no matter how far you zoom in or how large you make it by scaling it up. And also if you scale it all the way down, it has really good you know, instructions for how to display properly, even at really small sizes, just as well as it would on really large sizes. And so with traditional images, your GIFs, your PNGs, and JPEGs, let's say you have a small image and you make it larger, you're going to see what's known as compression. You're going to see artifact. You're going to see pixelation. You're going to see this weird rough edges that make your image look really low quality. But with an SVG format, though, an image that is crisp at a certain size is very crisp, even a larger size or even a much smaller size as well. And the way it does it is not by storing pixel data like a traditional image format, it stores actual drawing instructions on how to do the shape. This means that for any given width or height, your browser, your image editor, or whatever application you're in, the image is played appropriately because it's custom generated on the fly by whatever device it is in, typically your browser, because that's what we tend to focus on a lot these days. So here's an example of what an SVG element or an image looks like. It's a separate file, just like every other image you might have. It doesn't have to be, but for now we'll just say it's a separate file. And notice what you see here. Instead of seeing like individual instructions on what color to display at what pixel, you have a lot of words that kind of describe like a path, the color to give that path, and some, and some geometric outlines of how the image should ultimately be created. And then this allows for the browser, in this case, to adjust the path, adjust the size of everything, depending on how big the image ultimately needs to be. And so this flexibility is almost, is great because this means that your image is optimized for whatever size you're displaying it for without having this predetermined arrangement of everything that needs to be calculated and oftentimes poorly calculated because it's often blurry in the case of PNG images, JPEGs, and GIFs. So the pixel data is known that we have in our PNGs, JPEGs, and GIFs. They're known as raster image formats, where SVG is a vector image format, our PNGs, JPEGs, and GIFs are raster image format. And these are images where actual pixel data is stored. And like I mentioned earlier, this pixel data is not flexible at all. Now, why does this matter? And the answer to this ties into why SVGs have gotten a lot of popularity, especially recently. It has to do with this. It has to do with the large number of devices these days that are capable of displaying web content and web formats such as SVGs. And not only are they capable of displaying images like SVGs, they also happen to be high density displays. These are displays where you might have a physically small screen, but the number of pixels that's crammed in there is massive. These are high DPI displays. Everything from your watch to your thermostat to your desktops, your tablets, all display a lot and lot of pixels. So you might hear terms like 4K and 8K or retina. All these things are just 
different ways of saying, there's a lot of pixels being displayed on these really small screens. So on high DPI screens, even their image is being displayed the same dimensions, like 72 by 72, 100 by 100, what we may have, you know, the way we might have originally specified it, it'll be displayed using extra pixels because the density is higher, which means that if you want our image to display properly in these high DPI screens, it needs to scale even though what we visually see is still the same fixed width. And so for fixed width and height. So with raster image formats, our images will always appear blurry or mostly appear blurry. So the physical screen is asking for more data than what the original image contains inside it. This means that you will have a wall of blurry images. And many of you who may have purchased a high DPI screen or a high DPI laptop a, a while ago, let's say about three, four, five years ago, if you navigate to any of your websites, what you might have seen were variations of exactly this, where the images and icons and just other visuals appeared really blurry, which seemed really bizarre because nothing about your resolution necessarily changed, right? So that's where SVGs really come in, because with SVGs, the amount of pixel data and all these things are not really a problem because the image will scale and display with all the crispness and sharpness that you might expect the original image might have retained. So here's an example of a take-up container is an SVG. It looks good small, looks good bigger, looks good much bigger, and even when you make it really large size, notice that the individual shapes and the ge geometric patterns that make this up are still properly defined or still properly represented. No blurriness whatsoever. Whereas you can totally imagine if you had like a, an image of it at the size, like a PNG for example, you start seeing the blurriness very, very quickly, shortly afterwards. Now, with all the things that SVGs have going for it though, they're not perfect, which is why it's not the default format that all of us tend to use. And the reason is this. It's a terrible format for displaying really complex visuals like the photographs, like blocks of text, and other things that are more difficult to describe than by using simple lines and shapes and paths and other geometric instructions. And so that means that a lot of things you still need your traditional image formats like JPEG and PNG for. So SVGs are great for displaying shapes and other visuals that can be simplified and easily constructible. I put both forms of it because you know, depending on where in the world you live, constructible can be spelled with an I, or it can be spelled with an A, or if you are very picky about the type of dictionary you're using, I think the Oxford English Dictionary uses the I version of it. I posted both because I don't feel like debating the spelling of constructible right now. Anyway, getting back to this, SVGs are great for geometric patterns. So a great example of it is icons. The icon library I use on the website and other videos is from Twitter's Trimoji collection. And these are all primarily SVGs that I export as SVG. And if you can take a look at how they look like, they're very simple in terms of how they're represented. It's a lot of lines, a lot of shapes, very little text because those are all challenging to represent as an SVG. But what do we do about the problem we talked about earlier, where we have high DPI screens that need to be able to display content really crisply and if you don't have an SVG, what are you going to do there? Well, raster images aren't terrible. They still have their many, many major uses. And so one traditional technique that is used, something known as downsampling. So if we know that we need to display an image at a particular size, the image we provide as a PNG or a GIF or a JPEG is provided at a much larger size. So therefore, if we're displaying it on a higher density screen, physically it looks smaller, but because there are pixels needed, this extra detail is very, very important. And if you actually ever take a look at some of the images on the website, like the screenshots I use, for example, I actually end up uploading them at double or triple the resolution they were originally taken at, just so that if you're viewing it on a phone or an iPad or a, a really high density screen or high DPI screen, it still looks crisp, even though that the physical dimensions of it might be very small. So the trick is downsampling. That's something I might cover in the future as well. So there you have it a whirlwind overview of what SVGs are, what makes them great, and also what makes formats like PNGs, JPEGs, and GIFs less ideal for some situations and perfect for many others. So hopefully this gave you a better appreciation of what SVGs can do, when to use them, and when to rely on some of the other formats because, hey, they still have their uses. So with that, if you want to learn more, go to crypto.com where I have articles on this and other topics that may be of interest to you. If you need any help, post in the forums at forum.crypto.com. That's the fastest and bestest 
way to get in contact with me. So don't try posting anywhere else. Like if you post on YouTube, I might see it much, much later and I might not be able to reply to it because the formatting options are very limited in terms of code snippets and so on. You can find me on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, pretty much anywhere that at Krupa is available, unless it's some other Krupa, in which case you probably shouldn't follow them. No, I'm kidding. They're probably great people as well. If you like this video and you want to do more of like these things, tell your friends and enemies to, you know, check this out and give feedback. Hit subscribe to be notified of more videos in the future. Follow me on Twitter for more bite-sized updates on new content, on just web developer things that have been interesting. And buy my books. You know, I have several books that are somewhat tangential to this topic. Animations, React, Beginner's Guide on JavaScript and how to do things on the canvas and many more as well. So if you just go to Amazon, type in Karupa, this Karupa, not some other Karupa, and check out some of the books there. And if you find this material enjoyable, you might find the books enjoyable as well. No guarantees though. All right, everyone. Talk to you all next time.